for today, um, exploring some yoga wisdom. The topic that we're going to be exploring is connected to karma, which is connected to the understanding of reincarnation and compassion. How can these reconcile? In other words, people are suffering. This world is a place of suffering. There is no doubt about that. There is suffering here of various kinds. So why is there suffering? Why do we suffer? What is the cause of it? And of course, more importantly even, is what is the solution? And how does compassion or care for others, if, we, if we're going to go, well, you know, each person is suffering, um, they, in quotes, deserve it because of something they've done, then where is the question of compassion or care for others? So this is what we'd like to explore things. So before speaking, let me take a moment to pay my deep respects and gratitude to my spiritual teachers and to Lord Chaitanya, Lord Nityananda, and to the Supreme Sri Krishna. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Siddha Swarupananda Paramahalsa Itinami Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shivasadi Govata Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So this idea of karma and reincarnation or transmigration of the living being is there in all dharmic spiritual paths. By dharmic I mean in yoga, in Buddhist teaching, Jains, uh, in Hinduism. This idea of an eternal soul, the eternal Atma, the living being, uh, who, is, who has no beginning and no end. In other words, as we cover regularly, we speak from the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna talks about for the living being, there is never birth nor death. The living being, having once existed, never ceases to exist. The living being is eternal and ever-existing undying. This is the nature of each one of us. So this particular experience we're going through for these, you know, three score and ten, um, which is 70 years if I remember, a score if I remember in the old days, a score means 20. So this idea that we have a life of three score and ten means, you know, somewhere in about 70 or 80, um, this particular part of our journey will cease and we'll move on to what the next part of our journey is. So for each of us, this is not, the f we didn't begin at the existence, uh, we didn't, our existence did not begin when our parents had sex or when we were, you know, the baby came out of the birth canal, when we came out of the birth canal. That is not when we, be we existed, we, our existence came into being at that time. We were already existing. We are eternal, so we, it means we have always existed. So this particular phase of this 70 or 80 years is a, is a sequence of different events that happen to us. You know, people talk about, well, you know, we have different lives and this is one life. In reality, we only have one life because we are life and we are eternal. So in reality, we don't have many, many lives. If we look at it more clearly, what it is is we have different experiences in different bodies for a particular period of time. But we only have one life our life is eternal. And in each one of these lives, we act in different ways. And for each action, for every action, there was uh, a reaction. This is known as the law of karma, or as is put in, in the Holy Bible very clearly, as you sow, so shall you reap. This is not difficult to understand, is it? What we do comes back on us. If you're nice to someone, there's a good chance that nice will come back. If we hurt someone, either verbally, verbally or physically, or rip someone off, etc., etc., then of course this also will come back for us to experience. You know, even in our language outside of the, you know, the, the sacred text, there's the saying, what goes around comes around. What you do comes back on you. So the main thing I wanted to focus on in exploring this evening is this idea that because sometimes people ask well if if what we're experiencing now 
in this life is due to things that we have done in the past. So does that mean people who are suffering, you know, maybe they have some disease or some deformity of the body or their situation is not very good in life, that means they are responsible for their experience, right? Is that understandable? If the law of karma is there, as you sow, so shall you reap, that also means that as I am reaping, I must have sown. That's, is that easy to understand the idea? You know, whether you agree or disagree is a different topic. But this idea of as you sow, in other words, if you plant an apple seed, what do you think might come out and grow from that seed? Bananas? Pawpaws? No, yeah, apple. And if you have a tree which has apples on it, what kind of seed could we guess would have been planted to produce that apple tree? Probably an apple tree, an apple seed, right? So this, at least this idea is clear. So therefore, if someone is suffering, then they must have sown something in the past to now be reaping what they have suffered. Is that also understandable? At least theoretically? I'm not sure. A few people are nodding, a few people are just kind of staring ahead. I'm sure of where this is going to go. So to bring it in connection with compassion. Well, if that person has done something to deserve whatever they are experiencing in this life, does this not then remove the idea of compassion for them? Because they are simply getting what they deserve. Has anyone thought about this? You know, even maybe you accept the idea of, of karma, but this may be something which kind of stands out a bit as being, well, gee, that's, that's not going to be very helpful because if that person deserves it, then why should I do anything to help them? Just let it run its course and that's their karma. What do you think about that idea? Yes, but, yes, it, that's correct. The idea of karma is not to punish, it is to help us to learn. But the question I'm asking is, should we help someone who is suffering? Because if they are suffering, it is directly due to what they have sown. So therefore, should we go out of our way to help people who are suffering? Why? Yeah, so, so for those who can't hear, some people are saying, well, yes, it's also connected to our karma that if we do good for others, good will come back to us. This is correct, but this is not actually the real solution nor, nor the, the, the avenue that we want to explore. So let me ask you this question. So if we only have compassion because if we only do something good for others so that I will get something back for me, I will get good karma, that's still selfish, isn't it? It's still all about me. What am I going to, I mean, I'll, I'll help this old lady across the street so that I'll get something good out of it. Well, that's not really compassion, that's still selfish, isn't it? Yes or no? Yes. So, as long as, we, well, as long as we live a life where we're simply concerned about ourselves, now whether the self be the health of my body, my education, my career, you know, what I'm getting out of life, there is a paradox. As long as I simply pursue my own so-called self-interest, I can never be happy. I will never actually find satisfaction, happiness, joy, fulfillment, as long as I am simply focused on me and my life and what I'm gaining from the actions that I engage in. This is where in the Vedic or yogic tradition, there is a concept called seva. Seva means service, selfless service where I actually do something for others without any expectation in return at all, not even good karma. In fact, it is so selfless, even if I get bad karma for, do it, for doing it, I will do it. Do you understand the difference between that kind of consciousness or way of seeing things? So now to come back into this idea of compassion, and because it is an argument that many people put forward, particularly those who may be uh, not of the Dharmic traditions, maybe they consider themselves to be of the Christian tradition, and, uh, and I've had people say this to me on different occasions, well, this will make it so that people are not compassionate. And this is actually not true, and I'd like to explain, if I can, why and how it all connects. 
What this really is revealing is the limited nature of the compassion that that person is seeing. In other words, well, why would I help someone if it's their fault? Is that understandable? Why would I help somebody if it's their fault? So therefore, you know, in their argument, it means, well, this will eliminate compassion and care for others from the world if we accept this reality of reincarnation and karma. But this is not true, as I said. This is actually simply a reflection of, of the limited nature of the compassion as that person is seeing it. In other words, I will only care for others if someone else hurt them. In other words, if it's not their fault and they're suffering because of someone else's fault, not their fault, so to speak, then I will help that person. Do you understand how it's a different kind of compassion? This is akin to, let's say, someone is going across the pedestrian crossing. They're walking across a busy highway. And, and they're walking across you know, the pedestrian crossing where you're supposed to cross. You know, they're looking left, looking right, looking left again. And then they're walking across the road. Someone runs a red light and smashes into them and injures them badly. So then, of course, out of care and compassion for someone, you would help such a person, right? Naturally, you would want to you know, call an ambulance, get them to the hospital, do whatever you need to do to help them. Because they were doing the right thing, but someone else ran the red light, and therefore it's someone else's fault. But let's say some, some young woman is, is you know, in a hurry to get somewhere, and she's running across the same highway, but she's doing it where there's no lights and there's no crossing or anything, and she's kind of just... You know, in a hurry and, and you know, shouldn't be doing it. You know, she shouldn't be running. There's just a, you know, a pedestrian crossing just down there a bit. But she's running across here, the same busy highway. And then as she's trying to cross the road, she gets hit by a car. In other words, she was involved in making that decision that to run across the road where it was not safe. In other words, it was her decision making and her actions which caused her to be hit by the car. Is that understandable? So therefore, am I to say, well, just leave her, it's her fault. She should have gone down a pedestrian crossing. She could have waited until the lights changed and then she could have crossed. Just leave her, it's her fault. Do you think anyone here would do that? I hope not. In other words, compassion is unconditional. It's not on the condition that if someone is good and deserving, I have compassion. But if someone's, you know, it's their own fault, then I will have no compassion for them and, and I will leave them to suffer. Because real compassion is non-different than, maybe we can call it spiritual compassion or absolute compassion, which means it is unconditional, whether someone deserves it, in quotes, or does not deserve it. And there's a nice example that my spiritual te teacher used to really make this very clear. So the scenario is there is a family going, they're camping out in the, you know, in the bush for two or three days. They have their tent and everything and they're going, you know, doing different bush walking things here and there. And one of their children is a 12 year old boy. So they tell the 12 year old boy, who's a little bit active and a bit independent now, to stay close to where we're walking. There's, you know, snakes and things and there's, you know, there's cliffs because, you know, they're going in different places and you, know, you can fall off a cliff and things like that. Just stay close to where we are. Okay? All right? He goes, yeah, okay. But this boy decides, he's a bit independent. He decides, well, I know there's a tree over here somewhere that's got certain kind of fruit on it. I want to go and check that out and get some of the fruit from that tree. So he kind of wanders off away from the path where the, where the whole family, your know, mum and dad and the rest of the kids are going. And by decisions, he made the decision to go off the path and to leave the company of his family, even though his father and mother said, stay with us. Okay, first mistake, right? It's his, he made that decision. And then as he's walking through the bush, he's also making different decisions to go here, to go there, to turn left, right, go down and look at this other thing down here in this gully and go and check. Something. So he, over time he gets lost by the different decisions he makes to go here and there. And then what eventually happens is that he ends up falling off a cliff into a rock face below, badly injured, many bones broken. So what do the parents do, you know? So let's say the parents go, you know, where's Johnny? Well, obviously he didn't, hang, he didn't do what we told him to do. He didn't hang around close to us. He wandered off. So uh, it's his fault, who cares? And we just keep on walking and forget about little Johnny. Do you think any parent would do that? 
Oh, so what do they do? They panic. And they go, we've got to find Johnny. So they call, get helicopters in, they get the rescue guys in. They themselves are, are walking through the whole you know, bush looking for them. And then when they finally find Johnny and they see he's fallen off this cliff edge and he's lying you know, badly injured below you know, on, the, on rocks, again, what decision do they make? Well, you know, it's his fault. Um, he'll learn from that. You think? Well, when he, you know, well, bloody learn from that one, I'll tell you. No, immediately, you know, the, the parents would even put their own life in peril to, to go down to where their son is. And what do they do? Do they start yelling at Johnny? Or are there tears of concern and compassion for their son who's injured? So this is the real nature of compassion. It is actually unconditional. Just like that spiritual love that the Supreme Soul has for each one of us, this is unconditional. Whether we are good, whether we are so-called bad, whether we are loving God or not loving God, that absolute spiritual love is unconditional. No matter what decisions we make, and no matter where we go or what we do. So compassion, real compassion is absolute. It is not conditional. It's not on the condition that I will get something out of it, and it's not on the condition that it's not their fault, therefore I will help them. Because compassion means this person is suffering, therefore I need to help them. So they will help little Johnny get to the hospital and do all the things they need to do. They will be there in a hospital room with him, supporting him, caring for him, loving him. So the idea that karma, the reality of karma and reincarnation will eliminate compassion for others is false. As I said at the beginning, it is due to um, not real compassion. It is due to limited compassion. And it more reflects on where that individual is themselves um, and where, on who they want to bestow compassion and care rather than the, the reality of karma or the reality of reincarnation making it so that their compassion is not there for the suffering of others. That was basically what I wanted to talk about tonight, just to make that clear for those who may have that, may have that question or that concern. That, you know, because each one of us are connected, as we know. You know there's this whole thing about you know, we, we are one, I mean, of course, we are all eternally individuals, but each one of us is connected. Each one of us is a part of, a spark of the Supreme Soul. So everybody, we are related to everybody, no matter what their religion is, no matter what their culture is, their background, their ethnicity, their size, their sex, anything. We are all actually connected. So to actually have care and love and compassion for others is the nature of the soul. And to act upon that is known as karma yoga or bhakti, loving devotion. So anything that was the main idea I wanted to touch on tonight. Is that at least clear, the idea that karma and reincarnation does not eliminate love or compassion? Okay. Do you want to have a question maybe on that idea? Yeah, the idea of reincarnation, it's simply, in that story of little Johnny, is a complete understanding. By the decisions we make and the actions based upon those decisions, there is a result. There is a reaction. So as Johnny thought, well, you know, I'm not going to follow mum and dad. I'm going to go off and do what I want to do. So that, that decision right there ended up affecting his future experience, didn't it? If he had a stuck with mum and dad and the rest of the family, his destiny would have been different. So it's rooted in decisions that we make. Because from decisions comes actions. And from actions comes destiny in the, in the form of what comes back to us. So every day we get a chance to make decisions. We are making decisions every single day. So that's why it's described in, in the yoga teachings that our destiny is in our hands by the decisions that we make. So the question was, is what we're experiencing in this life due to what we have done in our previous life or many, many lifetimes? Yes, many lifetimes. 
There are very, there are, karma is experienced in varying degrees. If we come back to this idea of seed, like, you know, what you, as you sow, so shall you reap. So, you know, when you have a seed, you know, that seed, when it's in its dormant state, there's, there's no fruit, right? It's just like an apple seed. So you can have an apple seed, in other words, there's karma or fruit lying dormant that hasn't yet fructified. Then there's also a seed can sometimes then sprout. So it's just begun to sprout. There's some result coming from that. And then of course there's a bigger tree and then there of course is a tree with fruit on it. So there are these different, the karma is in these different stages of development. So again, to try and move out of this idea of previous lives is, is a good idea. Because you start thinking of it in a different kind of context. It's like saying what you did, not only what you did yesterday, Saturday, is a, you know, you're going to experience today, it's what you did Friday as well. That's really different than thinking, oh, different lives. It's not really different lives because there is only one life, we are eternal. But it's like, not just last life, in quotes, but the lives before that means you know, maybe going back as far as Monday. Let's say, on, you know, today's Sunday, right? So maybe on Monday, you know, you kind of swore at someone and cut them off, you know, in your car, right? And you think, you know, you drive home and you got away with that. There was no consequences. But, you know, driving home tonight back up to Mount Tambourine, that guy sees you, that same guy that you cut off sees you. So, you know, you may not reap the, you know, the result may not happen until Sunday night, even though you, the stuff you did on Monday is what is the cause of what you're going to experience on the way home tonight. Is that understandable? So, so it is with you know, the law of karma uh, and how we experience it is it's directly connected to our actions. Yes, our previous bodies. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, even, even another way to see it even clearer is like you know, you've got a, a, t a grey t-shirt on and blue jeans, right? So today, let's say today you're wearing that. Hopefully you weren't wearing that on Monday as well. Right? <laughs> so you're wearing those clothes today. And while you've got those clothes on, you cut this guy off in the traffic, right? This is a better way to see it. And then on Tuesday, you've got a green shirt on and some shorts. Right? Different clothes. But you're still the same person. And when you've got the green shirt on and shorts, that guy sees you again as you're driving around and comes and swears at you and, and cuts you off, right? So even a, a clearer way to understand it is that because this body is compared to clothes that we, the self, are wearing, so we had different clothes on when I did those particular activities. Now I have a different suit of clothes on and I'm experiencing the result of what I did when I had my green shirt and shorts on. Is that understandable? Because that's actually what it is. And either way, there is a solution. There is a solution. We don't have to continue on this cycle of birth and rebirth. This is the beauty of what yoga is. And maybe I'll just, we can just touch on this, otherwise it can go on too long. Um, let me find this. This is explained really nicely in different yogic texts. So I'll read, I'll read a few of them. So this is from the first mantra of this Vedic text called the Sri Ushupanishad. There is a book known as the Upanishads. This is the Sri Ushupanishad. And there it is said, everything animate or inanimate that is within the universe, so animate and inanimate means living and non-living, Everything that is animate or inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Supreme. One should therefore accept only those things necessary for himself which are set aside as his quota and should not accept other things knowing well to whom they belong. The second mantra of the Sri Yashupanishad says, One may aspire to live for hundreds of years if he, if he continuously goes on working in that way, for that sort of work will not bind him to the law of karma. There is no alternative to this for the living being. So I'll read the two together. 
Everything animate or inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Supreme. One should therefore accept only those things necessary for himself which are set aside as his quota, and one should not accept other things knowing well to whom they belong. One may aspire to live for hundreds of years if he continuously goes on working in that way, for that sort of work will not bind one to the law of karma. There is no alternative to this for the living beings. So when one is living a life in harmony with the Supreme, and when one's whole life, one's work, one's everything is dedicated to the Supreme, is done in harmony for the Supreme, then such work does not bind one to the law of karma. This is known as karma yoga or bhakti yoga. Yoga meaning union with the Supreme Soul, karma meaning action or work. So action and work which is done in harmony with the Supreme for the pleasure of and in the service of the Supreme, that work is spiritual, that work is not material and there is neither good karma nor bad karma in connection with spiritual activity. It is what is known as a karma. In Sanskrit the word a before a word means not or no. So a karma means those actions which one can engage in in which there is no karmic reaction to them. In fact, they help me to grow in my spiritual life. So, you know, we've mentioned this many times. It can be a variety of different things. To put on this program this evening, then someone, you know, had to hire the hall. Someone put out the seats and the cushions that we're sitting on. You know, the band came and set up the PA and tuned the instruments. You know, someone, some number of people are cooking a meal for us. Afterwards, people will stay behind and clean up. All of these actions, because they are done in the form of karma, yoga, these actions do not bind those individuals to the wheel of karma or of reincarnation. In fact, they are purifying to one's life, they are purifying to one's consciousness also, because they bring one closer to the Supreme. And those actions are done in the service of and for the pleasure of the Supreme and all other living beings. They are savor or selfless service. So one can actually learn how to, I think Christ said this, to live in the world but not be of the world. To live in the world but not be of the world. And the same idea is there in yoga where the description is given that in the same way that a lotus flower can grow in a dirty, filthy pond but not be touched by the filth of the pond because it rises above it, Similarly, through karma yoga or spiritual cultivation, we can live in this world and be untouched by, the, by this world, which includes things such as karma. So the goal is not just simply to have good karma. We are not looking for good karma. If anyone is thinking, yeah, well, I'll just do good. Yeah, good luck on that one. Have you ever walked down the street? Have you ever smacked a mosquito? Have you ever, ever eaten anything in your whole life? Even as a vegan, you are taking life. Even as a vegan, we are killing. We are killing the plant, living being, body, the plant. So we cannot live simply by trying to negate bad action. I'll only do good action. Even that question arises, well, what is good action? Because you're good to someone and someone else is bad as well. So the, the Vedic teaching, the yoga text, say, this, there's actually a way in which you can live. Even if, like, maybe I'll touch on this point because it's important. Okay, I'm just going to have good karma. So I'm going to forget all the bad karma, I'm just going to do good, pious things, help people, really be nice to people, never swear at people, never be angry at people, never hurt any other living being. Okay, so now I have this huge amount of good karma due to me. Therefore, I won't suffer, right? No. To have good karma, let's say I have 99% good karma and only 1% bad coming back to me. Of course, this is impossible, but let's say that's the scenario. Okay, to, to reap what I have sown, because karma is, is connected to material activities. Material activities, not spiritual activities. It's material activities. In the, in the pursuance of our material goals. I must take on another body when I leave this body behind. So even if I have a whole stock of good karma, 
I have to take on another body to experience that back onto me, all this good stuff back to me. That means a body. I must take on a body. So the body may be born in a rich family, in a, in a nice country which is relatively peaceful and safe. And maybe my parents are quite well off. I go to a good school. My body is handsome and strong and healthy. Right? This is all the result of good karma. And you know, maybe you know, things just you know, fall into place for me. Good university, good results, good career, good job. All this stuff's going well, right? Good karma. But what comes along with that and with every single body that we live in is birth, disease, old age, death. So these are built into any material body. So even striving simply for good karma is not desirable. And the transcendentalist is not looking just to reap good karma to get a better birth next time. This is very short-sighted. In fact, the goal of spiritual life is to actually transcend this cycle of birth and rebirth completely. And that is spiritual cultivation is how we do that. And that is a longer story, of course, but, um, and we won't go into it all now. But I'll read a couple of more verses here from the Bhagavad Gita, which um, will give us some insight. So here Krishna, the Supreme Soul, is saying, The steadily devoted soul attains unadulterated peace because he offers the results of all activities to me. So here's actually the key, if you listen to it. The steadily devoted soul attains unadulterated peace because he offers the result of all activities to me. Whereas a person who is not in union with the divine, who is greedy for the fruit of their labor, becomes entangled. Therefore, one who has renounced the fruits of his actions, whose doubts are destroyed by transcendental knowledge, and who is situated perfectly in self-realization, is not bound by one's actions, a conquer of riches, Arjuna. So therefore, this is the ultimate solution to this problem of reincarnation is karma. And karma is actually learning how we can harmonize our life uh, with the Supreme. Thank you very much. <laughs>